Bishop, I would really like to thank you. In case it, it, Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, name was never spoken in St. George's Chapel, because when I heard you say his name, you just connected the whole world for me. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank oh, you very thank much you. for that. That's great. Commissioner. I have never been so proud to say that I work at Cafe Divine at St. David's Episcopal oh. Church. <laughs> Cafe Divine. And I love boy, it. am I going to have a good story for Sunday, which is my next shift. Oh. <laughs> You did have a worldwide audience. Um, many of us here were up mm. at four o'clock in the morning watching four the, the morning. royal wedding. <laughs> Can you give us some insight into what that experience was like? If you could have spoken longer, how long could you have spoken? Oh, oh, oh. oh we'd still be going on. I mean, we could. Oh, Thank yeah. you. I knew that was the answer. But can you give us just a little yeah. backstory? What was that experience like? What was that like? You know, it really was. Um, on on some levels, it was very intimidating, yeah. uh, um, extremely intimidating. Um, and and then on other levels, it was a wedding. Yeah. I've been a priest for close to 40 years. I've married a lot you of couples. You married a lot of people, I married a right? lot of yeah. couples. That's right. And, and they were like every other couple, mm -hmm. and yet unlike. Right. <laughs> I mean, all at the same time. Right. Um, the, the, I mean, people couldn't have been more gracious in terms of the family and the arrangements. Uh, but the fun, there, was some fun, there were some funny parts in it. First of all, I didn't believe it when I got the phone call. Um, I got a member of my staff, they, I was traveling, and a member of my staff, um, Chuck Robertson, got hold of me and said the Archbishop of Canterbury is looking for me, and I'm thinking, oh, what has the Episcopal Church done now? <laughs> what have you, you know, I mean, I really was kind of thinking, God, I what have we done? And, um, and so he said, uh, uh, they, he, the question was, if you were asked, would you be available to preach at a royal wedding on May the 19th? And I remember saying, Chuck, get out of here. What is it you really want? I mean, that's, uh, I mean, he had to convince me that this really right. was going to. So anyway, once he convinced me, I said, well, yeah, I'm sure we can make some How can you say no? Uh, yeah, right. Which is, I think, the reason for the oblique question, if you were asked, would you be available? To I, I, I assume you don't tell royalty no. I, I, I've never interact. I don't interact daily with royalty, so I don't know. But anyway, right. uh, and so finally, once we kind of realized we couldn't tell anybody, um, and we had to get permission to at least let the Diocese of Arizona, the Bishop of Arizona, know, because I was supposed to be in Arizona on May the 19th. Couldn't you have made something up? Yeah, I could have, I guess. And but then you just <laughs> could forgive yourself, right? I mean, <laughs> That's right. So we eventually, but they gave us permission to yeah. tell him, but only him. And so he couldn't tell his diocese why. They finally understood. And, uh, but, it, but all of that went on. And then I had all this anxiety about, I mean, I kind of was doing what I was normally doing. And I said, oh, gosh, please don't pick. They had to pick the passage, the scripture passage that was going to be read at the service. And I was hoping they wouldn't pick 1 Corinthians 13. I mean, I love 1 Corinthians 13, but I really didn't want to preach on 1 Corinthians 13. And when they picked the Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs, yeah. I was shocked. I really didn't expect that. And that created a context. That actually created the sermon. Um, right. it, it really did. Yeah. Um, and, and so that was kind of a moment. And then we kept getting messages. Originally, the sermon, I, was, I had four minutes. Um, and then we got word, and you get word, it kind of goes from palace to palace to palace. And then, and then eventually they call, get us, uh, the archbishop gets us. And so it started out at four minutes. Then I think it went to six or seven minutes. Then at the rehearsal the day before the director, there was a director behind the scenes said, you got eight minutes or so. And I heard or so. <laughs> Bishop, Bishop, who among us has not taken the over? I mean, that's what happens, exactly, right? yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, and so, of course, and so folk were wonderful. The, another. How, how long did you speak? Uh, it was thirteen minutes, <laughs> or so, or so, or so, or, 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 or give so. or take a little while. So. Thank you so much. Thank you. Excellent, sir. Chris, I wanted to ask those questions too, but I thought I got 26 minutes. I want to talk about serious stuff. I want oh, to talk about making Yeah, you got to get it in. Yeah. Right. I'm Leave glad that somebody to us. else asked, though. That's good. <laughs> yeah, thank sure. you for that. Evan and Bishop, thank you so much. My name is Brandon. I'm from San Marcos, Texas. And I really enjoyed how you brought politics and faith together. We've been talking about that a lot in our, our parish recently. But uh, I care a lot about mental health and mental illness and mm -hmm. how the church looks at and deals mm -hmm. with those. and. I've noticed that uh, I'm comfortable in the Episcopal Church because I'm able to talk about my mental illness and not be 
uh, shunned or stigmatized for that. And I know that's not the case for everybody. Right. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, Bishop, about how the things you've talked about today are related to that intersection mm -hmm. also, and how the Bible theology, our faith, leads to more openness and safety for people <coughs> who have mental illness. What, thank you for that and, and for asking that, because one of the things that's happened, um, and actually happened at this past general convention, which was here in, in Austin, um, was that a group has been convened to begin to think seriously about how do we help the church to become a more helpful and open place where the kind of conversation and work and support yeah. can, can happen in more intensive ways. And that group's wor literally working as we speak. I mean, they're, they're, they're um, um, in that process. There is more conversation, and, it's, it's, and I don't know what has occasioned it, um, but there is more public conversation about mental illness and how do we as a society, as just a human community, support each other and, and, and get people the help and support they need, but support each other. Um, and, and that's happening. I, um, I can't remember which political candidate, but one of them has been pretty forthright in, in talking about their own experiences. And I know another um, um, one has been talking about her father's experiences. Yeah. It, and it seems like it's beginning to, you know, there's something about when it's okay to talk publicly about something, that something begins to lose its diabolical power hold over us. I mean, anybody who's been in right. therapy knows that as long as something is not talked about and is kind of a secret or that it's hidden, it has a diabolical power over right. us. But when it's brought to light, you begin, then you can begin to have strategies for managing it. It's one of the reasons, if you read in the New Testament where Jesus encounters demons, sometimes he will say, what's your name? When you name it, bring it to light, that begins to help. And I think that's beginning to happen even in the church. We had a group that was, this isn't on mental illness per se, but on impairment of clergy and of bishops. What happened? We, we didn't have good structures for how do we engage when, of uh, a bishop. I mean, how do we engage um, if a bishop is impaired, uh, either from mental illness or addiction or some other issue where we need to have intervention and get them the help and, the, yeah. and not just the person, but the family, the community, the church community, and it goes on and on and on. Um, we weren't having that level of discussion um, until it's been in the last three or four years at the convention 2015. When right. that, and so now the conversation is finally happening. And I think there's going to be some good work that's going to grow out of that. I, I don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but it's going yeah. to grow out of that. And so thank you for asking it and keep pushing. Thank you so much, Bishop. Thank you. Evan. We've thank spent you, about 15 years in this country talking about how faith communities are going to have to take on and take over what were once the responsibilities of government, where government has gotten out of the business of solving certain social issues right. or problems. And we think that the church or the church community should take care of it. So it's probably not that surprising that that issue would land on your doorstep, right? And, and it makes sense. I mean, I mean, theoretically, right. I mean, at their best, church communities are communities. <laughs> right. At their best. Now, I know that's not always the case, but at their best. Yeah. And a community is going to be the context in which uh, mental health struggles um, it, are going to really be cushioned um, and, and really nurtured. Right. Um, one of the, just a quick side note, yes, one sir. of the things I was in Botswana some years ago um, and um, um, talking to the head of public health there, uh, the minister of health there, um, and uh, one of the things that he was saying was that um, the, the less, the more people are uprooted from the villages and tribal connections and family connections and pushed into the cities, into the urban environments, they were seeing increases in, in mental illness and, and mm -hmm. struggles. So that there is something about human community yep. <laughs> that actually is the context for the kind of healing and, and flourishing that's possible for human beings. And the truth is, we may be each other's biggest headaches, but we can't get along without us. But you know, we're, we're, we're both, we need the, each we're other. both the problem and the solution. That's right, right? we need each other. Ma'am. Hey y'all, um, my name is Nikki and I am really glad to be here. Um, while y'all were talking earlier, you talked about making space for love and, mm -hmm. and having those conversations. I've been a part of a weekly pint night um, where a diverse group of folks just kind of hash out the world and it's been for years. And in the last couple of years, those conversations have gotten a lot harder to have because they're not so much about um, 
just like general politics and you know what's going on with sports and whatever, it's gotten deeper and deeper and closer and closer. And just recently, I stopped attending because during one of those talks, people were espousing the idea that racial discrimination for housing, employment is fine, and maybe that's libertarian, and maybe there needs to be space for that. And I started to feel like being in that context was actually giving space for flourishing of mm. antisocial and anti-love, very hateful positions. And so I'm moved by that idea that I need to get back in the conversation, mm. but how do you do that when so much of what can be said in this context where it's, you know, the most powerful people in the world are espousing yeah. hateful positions. Yeah. Um, as you said, you know, if Jesus is your guy, you can't really, bigotry's hard to, right. to, to support if Jesus is your guy. So I don't know if you have any advice on how to create that space and how to flir flourishing the love when you're in those communities. You understand how hard it can be to yeah. hear things that make you want to run in the other direction from a difficult yeah. conversation yeah. like this. So what, is, what, what are your strategies to get people to stick with the idea that there's love eventually at the end of the road there? Well, one for you is to do what you just did here, there. Mm. Name it. Name it. You, you literally just articulated um, what's an appropriate concern um, that might actually have the potential to help the group get back on target. And you just did it here in front of with us. So consider this your rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> really, I, I really, I, I do, I think. And I, and I do think that kind of engagement um, really is one of the strategies, one of the approaches. Because um, the reality is we really do live in, um, I mean, we are more, uh, what was the book, uh, The Big Sort, um, uh, a few years ago? Yeah. Um, uh, where the demographers have actually shown that America has pretty much resegregated itself, um, um, not just by race, but by political ideology or socioeconomic, socioeconomic class. class and over and over again. I mean, it is as though, you know, we thought we buried Jim Crow and, and Jim Crow, like, thought Easter was about him and he rose from the dead or something. I mean, it's like, you know. And, and, and so how do you break through that? Um, well, you break through that by doing precisely the kind of thing that you're doing in that right. group. And I think we really do have to make a commitment to the kind of cross dialogue and relationship um, that eventually knits us together over time. It takes right. to, over time. And I think that's really going to be the creed. We can pass all the laws we want, and we need to pass them. Right. Um, but ultimately, we've got to have a law of love that can regulate the heart, and that will emerge in relationship. It, it, it's one thing it's, if you've had hope and you lose it to have enough faith that you can get that hope back. Yeah. It's another thing if you are so young that you've never actually been taught that the world is fundamentally good. I worry about younger people in this country, kids particularly, who are coming to this essentially um, not having any context for what we're seeing right now. Right. All they know is this. Yeah. So what do you do about that? You know, I, right after the royal wedding, I was on, um, you know, interviewed and that kind of thing. And um, I actually, um, uh, the folk from TMZ called our office and, uh, oh, y'all, yeah, yeah, I know, you know, I, yeah. And, and so I was like, kind of, wait a minute, should the presiding bishop of the episode TMZ? And I was like, really? But, and I said, well. I'd like to know what your press people told you about that. Oh, I know. They, they were like saying that. So I did it. I went ahead and so did, you did it. it. And, and yeah, and part of their pitch right. was they said, you know, most of our audience is young. Right. Um, they're young adults. These are, they said, you're gonna, this is going to actually get you to an audience that you don't get to. They, they got me. They hooked me. I said, <laughs> it was like, I mean, they just reeled me right in. And actually, it turned out, it really was a good interview. And they asked me that precise question. They basically, I've forgotten how he phrased it, but it was something like, most of our audience is composed of young people. Um, and they really resonated with the message of love. And they did. But they haven't lived as long as you have. And they really don't know, can it work? Yep. And I, they really, they pushed me back to really, they forced me to go deeper. And, and my response was, you know, it's not easy. I didn't say love is not, you know, going down the yellow brick road. It is not easy. It is not easy. Um, the king of love was crucified, yeah. <laughs> tortured to death. Better to be realistic so, about it. Yeah, let's get real. But the truth is nothing 
nothing has ever changed for the good that human beings have had anything to do with apart from somebody who was living a way of love. Mm -hmm. Very few things have changed. I can't think of things that have changed good. from selfishness. My daddy had polio when he was a little kid. Johanna Salk and the, the, the folk who um, invented the vaccines did it because of a love of people and a, will, a desire to end that disease yep. and to find a way. I mean, that you think about it. There's been no social good done apart from somebody who was seeking the good and the welfare of others. That's what real love is. So that the truth is, as difficult as it is, it actually is the way to move society and move human life forward. Ultimately, that's a faith claim. Yep. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, that's a, that's a claim of faith. That's where faith does actually come in. Um, but it's worth betting on because the alternative is unthinkable. Yeah. Thank good, you thank so you. Much. Are we okay with the one more? Okay, good. We have time for, um, we have time for this one last one, sir. Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, uh, hello, Michael. Good Ask what to call him. We worked together for yes. years and years in yeah, Baltimore. Yeah, there's not a chance I'm going to call him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, oh, you can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I know you know better in this context, but uh, he really likes to be called Michael. Um, uh, 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 Michael and I were serving in churches in Baltimore many years ago when he was uh, a, a parish priest, uh, and the the I think the most respected priest in the diocese of Baltimore, for a large part for the work he was doing. And I appreciate your comments about um, the Episcopal Church sort of taking the the forefront in a lot of social issues. Um, we have our history too. Uh, a lot of our churches were built by slaves mm -hmm. uh, and we're beginning to be able to acknowledge that and say what that means. Many of them are places where people of color do not actually worship in the churches that were built by slaves, um, uh, sadly. Uh, and we keep struggling with that. Uh, and, and the progress we've made has been remarkable. Uh, 45 years ago, women couldn't vote, uh, couldn't be on vestries and couldn't vote at general convention. Mm -hmm. And uh, Michael has succeeded a, a woman a presiding bishop. Correct. So to go from a woman presiding bishop to an African American presiding bishop uh, in our lifetimes is is really quite remarkable because we try to be on the cutting edge right. of, of justice issues and stuff. Um, but I wanted to, to say when we were in Baltimore, I used to bring my confirmation classes down to St. James Lafayette uh, Square uh, to hear mm. Michael preach. And part of that was I was in a North Baltimore church that was relatively affluent and almost exclusively white. And I wanted them to know that the Episcopal Church was something much greater than the the white suburban churches yeah. that sort of dominate our vision of ourselves. And so we would go and listen to, to Michael. And the other reason, I just wanted to hear them to know there were Episcopalians who could actually preach. Because <laughs> I, I pride myself. That, that's cold. I, well, I know, it, it, it hurts. I, I pride myself on, uh, on, on, on the comments I've gotten for 40 years of ministry about being a fairly good preacher. In fact, yeah. often a very good preacher. Sure. Um, but I took them down there because Michael had, uh, down in the well of the church, he had a very heavy, uh, very ornate lectern. And he would go down to, to preach. And after a while, you'd realize, and it was sort of like the well of, of a congress. There's a big round area in the front of it. And after a while, you'd realize that, that it, he was, it was on casters because he was rolling around <laughs> filled with energy, you bringing, yeah, yeah. bringing the sermon right to you in the yeah. front rows. Yeah. Um, and he would occasionally come up to a, a Redeemer Baltimore, yeah. which is a big and wonderful and, and uh, again, fairly white church uh, where there was good preaching, but yeah. it was that calm Episcopal preaching. And, and Michael would come and get in this great turret of a, of a pulpit. You remember that big round yeah, thing where you're looking down on everybody? Yeah. And he would begin to preach, and people would, oh, this is a lovely sermon. He's got a lot to say. He's, he's you know, so, and, and then you'd suddenly realize that he had started off sort of calm. And my image of you always in preaching is the steam locomotive. <laughs> Because you start preaching, and there's a rhythm, there's a, and there's that sort of your dad's Baptist stuff in your, in your hair, and, and there's this sort of thing like this. And after a while, you realize the locomotive is pulling out of the station, and he's sort of pounding and moving around in the pulpit yeah. and, and just filled with an energy that is so lacking mm. in a lot of... Well, we love God, yeah. and we love the Holy Spirit, and we've got the Holy Spirit, but we're not as expressive as, right. as his heritage brings. And so, and so my image was the, the locomotive is leaving the station, you need either grab on or get out of the way. It's a great image. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, thank and, you and for the that memory. The, the, the point of that, yeah. the whole story, background, was just to say, lots of people have said to me, I, uh, I was, and I was so, thank you for raising the, the royal uh, uh, wedding question, because it gave us a, 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 mm. a platform to the entire world that says, oh. the Episcopal Church, A, 
has an African-American bishop, which you know, most people don't think about because we're a big old white church, uh, and that we're very diverse, and that you represent that to us, and that also that you really preach. Um, the, the funny part to me is all people said, that is the most, inter uh, most energetic um, a sermon I've ever heard, and I said, that's the least energetic sermon he's ever preached. Ah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> very, very quickly, and then we're going to stop. Good. I have one question. Very quick, yes. Does the Episcopal Church have a strategy for dealing with non-love-based religions? Non-love-based religions. Hmm. Uh, the, a a the easy answer is a strategy, no. Okay. But... I mean, but Jesus. but but but, well, I, the real answer is no. There's no specific strategy. I mean, okay. that, that, it's not. But I would contend that our commitment to be a church, which is emerging, that really does follow in the footsteps of Jesus of Nazareth, and struggling but daring to live the way of love that that is an approach that will lead us to engagement not with not just not with the, just those who agree with us or like minded right but with those who disagree and that in the long run that leads to the kind of engagement that your question may be implying and yeah. hoping for and i should have been clearer in the yeah. non christian oh non christian non christian religions oh yeah we we, we do do that yeah Oh, I'm sorry. I, I misunderstood. Yeah, we, we, yeah, we, we're the Episcopal Church, both on the church-wide level and in local communities, um, is involved in both ecumenical and interfaith. Right. Um, I, I was at uh, a meeting not long ago with um, um, Islamic Relief USA, okay. and our Episcopal Relief and Development works with Islamic Relief USA. That's, that's the question. Right. We do that right now. Oh, yes, o yes. Always work and play well with others. Right? Uh, we do, that, yeah, that yeah. Excellent. Believe it or not, we're working together in Ghana, um, to reduce domestic uh, violence against women, um, working together, training both Anglican clergy, that's the Episcopal yeah. Church worldwide, and Muslim imams, because they're the people in the local villages to do workshops and training with men, um, as well as having plans for extricating women um, in situations of domestic violence. Great. And we do that together with Muslims. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Bishop, I know we need to get you on to your next thing. We are so grateful to you for your time. Thank well, you so thank much. Thank you. Excellent. And thank you all. Thank you.